Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to CCC's online worship experience here on this final weekend of 2020. I'm David Robinson, and I hope you had a really, really great Christmas. Probably looked a little different, but I still hope it was enjoyable and meaningful for you. I hope you've been assured anew of God's love for you this past week. That's what all these songs that are being sung throughout the service talk about, the love of God. We've taken several recordings from previous services throughout this year and put together a few specific songs that point to the great love of God that's available to us and we can experience because of our relationship with Jesus. That first one we just heard, your love awakens me. That's what it's talking about. That the whole reason we can be connected to God in the first place is because of Jesus Christ. This next song is one of my favorite songs we sing at CCC. It's called Stand in Your Love. And I hope at the end of this year, that's where you find yourself, right smack dab in the middle of the love of God, where His love for you really drives your life. I love how the Bible says this when the Apostle John very succinctly articulates it in his first epistle. 1 John 4, 16 says, we know and rely on the love God has for us. You can know the love of God. I mean, really know it. And not just that, but rely on it depend on it, live from it. That's a good place to be. And I hope that's where you find yourself today. The darkness tries to roll over my bones. 
sorrow comes to steal the joy I own But brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Cause there's power that can break off every chain. There's power. chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love when I'm standing in your love oh my fear doesn't stand the chance when I spoken word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so Serve it, still you give yourself away. 
you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come after me. So shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come after me. There's no wall you won't. Well, there's a song by Emmylou Harris that usually gets played this time of year. It's not particularly a Christmas song. It's kind of a folky song. It's called There's a Light. And it walks through several images that speak to the human condition apart from God and to the hope that God brings to us through Jesus. I want to point out one of those images today. Here's how Emmylou Harris says it. It will rain, it will rain in the desert. In the cracks of the plain, there's a treasure. Like the thirst of the seed we'll, we will await, we believe it will rain, it will rain in the desert. So think about this for a minute, because the Bible says this very same thing. I mean, a long time ago, the prophet Isaiah said something so very similar when he, he wrote in the 35th chapter of the book bearing his name, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. One day it's going to burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. All right, so think about what this looks like. They knew about desert and parched land in Isaiah's day. These are people who know what it is to live in drought. Water will gush forth, he writes, in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And the burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground one day will be filled with bubbling springs. We should understand this is a picture, not just of the earth as it is, but of the human soul. That's what Isaiah is talking about. This is the human condition. We are deserts. We are dry. We are barren. We are empty. We are hardly able to support life. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 42, too, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Or in Psalm 63, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. We are thirsty people living in a desert. Now in the Bible, to thirst means to be driven and tormented and controlled by unsatisfied desires. So let me ask you, do you ever long for anything? Do you ever ache for something? Do you ever find yourself unsatisfied and you just keep thinking, well, it's out there, you know, somewhere. I mean, it's out there somewhere and someday I'm going to get it, whatever it is. I and mean, when you get a little more of something, it always produces a burst of gratification and creates the illusion that, you know, if I just get it one day, then my soul will be satisfied. And so I spend my life looking for it. You know, when you're a little kid, this time of year, you, you hope you get that magical present at Christmas, you know, that you've always been longing for. And it's been different down through the years. I mean, when I was a kid, it was an Atari. Man, that was it. That's all we wanted. And then we got it. And we played Pong, watching that little square dot, hitting that little square dot back and forth over a line. We thought that was a bee's knees. Eventually, it was that specific game, Asteroids or Space Invaders. 
Then Nintendo came out and blew our minds. Tecmo Bowl. Good cow. Bo Jackson is unstoppable. But it has changed down through the years. I mean, it could have been a Red Rider BB gun or a Cabbage Patch doll or a G.I. Joe or a Lego set. I remember one year, my daughter, when she was like five years old, she wanted a for real go-go my walking pup. That was it that year. If you're a little older, it might be the you know new Xbox or PS5 or a new iPhone. If I could just have it, that's all I'd want. If I could just have that, I'd be happy for the rest of my life. But it never works, does it? If we fast forward 30 or 40 years from now, none of our kids are going to say, no matter what I faced in this life, I was sustained by the for real go-go my walking pup. That thing I got for Christmas when I was five, that did the trick for me. I mean, nobody ever says, you know, during the darkest hours of my life, during the biggest challenges and disappointments, I was just fine because I had that G.I. Joe I got as a kid. No, it doesn't happen. I mean, later on, it is more success, typically. If I could just make the team, or if I could just make the honor roll, or if I could just get that job, if I could just get that promotion, or if I could be CEO, if I were just more successful. You know, sometimes we think of it as some relationship. I mean, now I'm single, but I'll be happier when I'm seeing somebody. Well, now I'm seeing somebody, but I'll be happier when I'm engaged. Now I'm engaged, I'll be happier when I'm married. Now I'm married, I'll be happy when we get kids. Now I got kids, I'll be happier when the kids are gone. You know, It is always gonna happen at some point when relational things are different, but it never is enough. And then we end up bored or empty or dry inside. We live in the desert. Because no matter what we achieve or accomplish or possess or pursue, it never brings lasting soul satisfaction. And so we wake up to this voice that says, I got to have something else. I got to have more of it, whatever it is. It's like I'm on a treadmill that I just can't get off of. I'd like to be content and I'd like to be grateful and I'd like to be humble, but I can't get there. My soul feels hollow or empty or dry. So I keep busy or I keep working or I keep engaging in hobbies, or I just keep watching Netflix, but there is a desert inside of me. Well, God looks at us and he sees that we are dry and unsatisfied and empty and withered. We're just dry and empty inside. And one day God sends his son, Jesus. And Jesus stands up and says, hey, if anybody's thirsty, let them come to me and drink. As the scriptures say, he said, out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. He says, you can stop running after it. You can stop killing yourself. You can, you can let go of the idea that something out there somewhere will satisfy you. And in the meantime, it might hurt you a little bit. I mean, there'll be some sting to all of this. It doesn't just make you happier in the moment, but you can begin to die to that idea now and turn the focus of your desire on what ultimately is the only hope for soul satisfaction that your soul will ever know. And that's the God who made you and loves you. And one day it'll rain in the desert. And one day, all that you've ultimately longed and ached for can be fulfilled. The ultimate thirst can be quenched because God, because God saw and God cares and God sent Jesus into the world to offer you and me and anybody who wants in on it to drink from this well of water that does not run dry, to have living waters overflow from their life in the kinds of ways that really matter. We live in the desert, but the rain's coming. I don't know if there are any shows that you're into these days. I mean, with Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus, you can binge watch full seasons of a plethora of different shows. Before this year, I really wasn't a show kind of guy. I mean, I typically watched sports and movies. I'd go to the movies in the theater. I loved doing that. But eventually, throughout this year, there were a couple of shows I ended up watching. One was The Mandalorian, which season two just wrapped up, if you're into that. I, I dove into the Star Wars universe again through The Mandalorian. This is the way. Baby Yoda, all of that. That was fun. A lot of fun. The other was something that my wife, Melanie, and I decided to watch together. Well, we were looking for a show we could sit down and, and experience together, and we settled on The Crown. Now, when I say we settled on The Crown, it was either that or the Hallmark Channel, so we settled on the crown. 
And The Crown is this drama. There, there are four seasons total right now, and it's about the royal family in Britain, and it centers on Queen Elizabeth II's reign, and it begins when she first becomes queen in 1953, and then it sort of traces their history down through the years. Now, it's interesting enough stuff. I mean, I like history, and I love that history in the early and mid-1900s, and it's fun listening to those British accents, too. But there's a lot of depth to many of these episodes. And there's this one episode, it's called Moon Dust, I believe, where it's focused on Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband. And it starts with him sort of mocking faith a bit. You know, the Archbishop is uh, older and Prince Philip isn't connecting with the Archbishop and his messages and the church. And the Prince comes across as antagonistic to faith, actually. He's really going through a bit of a midlife crisis in some ways, although he wouldn't say that. It was in 1969 when this episode begins and the royal family is huddled around the television set and watching some of the big news of the day, which is the Apollo 11 launch and the subsequent moon landing. And to say that Philip, who's also a pilot, is obsessed would be an understatement. I mean, he binge watches the exploits of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins for hours on end, which just triggers an all-consuming discontent with his own life. He's thinking they're so bold and they're so courageous and brave and they're doing something that's never been done before in the history of humanity. And in his life, uh, well, he's, he's just returning home from another dreary official engagement. Uh, in this episode, they show him coming back from visiting a dental facility as part of his official duties. And so Philip's feelings of failure, they're, they're just sort of exacerbated when Windsor Castle's new in-house bishop, Dean Woods, he arrives with plans to create a religious academy for personal and spiritual growth. He wants to treat burned out clergymen and he ropes a very unwitting Duke of Edinburgh into one of their early group therapy sessions. In this uh, group therapy session, Philip, he, he just kind of snidely mocks everything Dean Woods and his fellow men of God are trying to achieve. He's calling the program a concentration camp for spiritual defectives. And he, he scolds the participants by, you know, sitting around and talking about pretentious, self-pietous nonsense instead of taking some sort of action. And he also makes a point of saying how certain he is that those Apollo 11 astronauts he's been so diligently watching what they've been doing, that they are at one with the world because they've achieved something spectacular, even going so far as to presume that they're at one with God and happy, he says. But Philip has really proved oh so gloriously wrong because a few months after their historic trip to the moon, the American astronauts visit Buckingham Palace where their biggest fan requests a private audience. And this meeting is really awkward to say the least because Philip, he presses these history-making astronauts for some grand existential observations about their experience. And what he gets instead are just lifeless procedural protocols. I mean, they say just as royal life is filled with protocol and procedure, well, so is the lunar mission. They said, we, we pretty much spent our entire time with lists in our hands, just clicking through the lists we had to do. Well, sometime after this anticlimactic meeting with the astronauts, the prince, he returns to this group therapy sessions at St. George's with the other clergymen that are there. And he breaks with every natural inclination within him to keep his feelings kind of bottled up. And he ends up admitting his midlife crisis. And he asks for help. He quotes his mother, Princess Alice, a woman of great faith, a nun actually, who spent a great deal of her life serving the poor. She had died earlier in the year, and before she had died, she asked the prince how his faith was. And he said very bluntly and coldly to that question, he said, non-existent. And now he's pleading for some guidance and for some direction from these men of faith. He literally says, help. I'm here today to ask for help. He's empty and he's dry inside. And he's had everything in his fingertips for years, but he's a desert. I identify greatly with that episode. It's been one of the most moving of the ones I've seen for many reasons. But I couldn't help but think of all the folks who try to pursue some sort of meaning in life and some, some sort of purpose in life some sort of fulfillment in life through some kind of achievement. I was thinking of folks who try to find fulfillment in something apart from God, you know, a job, 
some grades, even in some human relationship, family, kids, spouse. As wonderful as those things can be at times, they can't ultimately fill that void in the pit of your life that's reserved for God alone. Only He can ultimately fulfill you. And Prince Philip begins to seek his answers in the Lord in that episode, fictitiously, of course. I wonder if you find yourself unfulfilled or disappointed or discouraged here at the end of 2020. Everything you've tried this year just doesn't seem to do the trick. I don't know if you saw the most recent Gallup poll that studied the mental health, the mental state of folks this year. They've done this particular poll every year since 2000, I believe, and they measure the mental health of different demographics of people in our culture. They ask, how are you doing this year compared to last year? I mean, mental health has obviously taken a hit this year, but according to this Gallup poll, the only category of people that rated their mental health higher this year than last year is one specific category, one specific group. Do you know who it was? Weekly church attenders. Weekly church attenders. There's one group of people in our entire country that internally, in their inner world, are in a better place than last year. Only one group of people, weekly church attenders. And I think it's because those are folks who are tapped into the good news that there's a Savior who can satisfy, and they're tapped into it together. Man, we live in a desert, but the rain's coming, and there is no human system, no idea, no book, no therapy, no achievement that can quench the thirst and satisfy my ultimate desires. Only God can do that, gang because only God came from heaven to earth and sent the remedy for us all. Jesus, the perfect one, at just the right time, he was born as a vulnerable baby. He lived the perfect life. And at just the right time, he gave himself up. He went to a cross and he paid the ultimate price so we could know and rely on the love that God has for us. On the cross of Jesus, and this is why the symbol is known everywhere, on the cross of Jesus, the barrenness and brokenness and sin of the earth, mine and yours, and the grace and mercy and forgiveness of heaven, they come together on that cross. Jesus came to die. And fortunately for us, He didn't just come to die, but He rose again. He was resurrected. He was raised to life anew. All of God's promises to all of our aches and our thirsts, the hopes and fears of all the years, they are met in the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're going to commemorate that ultimate way everything gets put back together. You know, the darkness dismissed, the thirst fulfilled. One final time, we're going to celebrate communion. It's a powerful image Jesus himself set in motion so we wouldn't forget. So wherever you're watching this, take some bread and juice and remember God's great love for you and the opportunity of new life in Him because of Jesus.
For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes will not perish, they shall. As we wrap up today, I want to make sure you know you can give to support CCC's crucial mission of helping people find their way back to God. What you give makes all of this possible. And I want to challenge you as we wrap up this year to consider offering your best to support this local church, to supporting Community Christian Church. I believe in what we're doing here, and I'm really glad you're a part of it. You can give right now by texting CCC White Marsh to 77977. Or you can give through CCC's website, communitycc.net. Make sure to fill out the CCC card if you haven't already. And if you're watching the live stream, you can do that through the chat. Otherwise, you can fill the card out through the website. Now, one thing to be aware of is real important. Next week, the first weekend of 2021, we'll be all virtual with CCC services. So no in-person services on January 3rd. In-person services, those will kick back up on the 10th of January, but we'll be all virtual next week, January 3rd. So tune in right back here 
next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next year.